This week I'm going to share with you 10 photo processing tips using Adobe Lightroom Classic. How's it going everyone? My name is Todd Domini. I make videos here on YouTube about landscape photography. I do product reviews and I also do photo processing tutorials like this one. If all of these are topics of interest to you, I would encourage you to hit subscribe below so you can keep in touch and be notified of future videos as they come out. Okay, tip number one is to make a decision regarding lens corrections before you do anything else to your photo. Let me demonstrate for you what I'm talking about. So this is a straight out of camera image. Uh, haven't done anything to this. And the image is a little bit dark because I exposed for the highlights in the sky. So what I can do here is I can you know, bring up the exposure to you know, bring a little more light into that foreground. Now, as you can see, my you know, highlights up here are starting to clip. Let me just bring this up a little bit more. See, so the highlights are starting to clip so I can drop these highlights all the way down, which fixes my clipping problem. Let's just say, for example, you spent like 30 minutes on this and then you get all the way down here to the bottom to lens corrections and you're like, ah, I forgot to enable profile corrections and you enable it. Well, look at what happens. <laughs> the image gets way overexposed. I mean, the image looks completely different. And so now I have to go back up to the top and make all these changes again. When, if I could have just opened the image, come down here immediately, let me just hit reset, come down here to the bottom, enable profile corrections, went back up, and then started making my exposure edits, then I would be in a far better place. Okay, tip number two, use the black and white treatment when editing exposure. Now up here at the top of the right column in the basic uh, dropdown, you will see a toggle between color and black and white. Now, if you thought that black and white was included here as kind of like a nice shortcut so you can you know, quickly create a black and white photo from a color one, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could do that. I mean, you know, it serves that purpose if that's what you wanna do, but that's really not why it's here. The reason Adobe included this treatment toggle in this view is so that you can use black and white as a guide when editing exposure. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So up here at the top of basic, you can either, you know, click this with, uh, you know, your mouse or you can, you know, tap uh, V on your keyboard. So switching over to black and white. And now by doing that, all of the color has been removed from the image. And so now I can focus just on the luminosity of it. I can just focus on the blacks and the shadows and the midtones and the highlights and the whites without getting distracted by color. Think of color as being like an additive layer. It's something that enhances the underlying luminosity of the photo. And the reason why it can get tricky if you don't enable black and white when you're editing exposure is because you might start darkening your photo and think, you know, wow, those, those blue skies look, let me just do it really quick. And you think, wow, those blue skies are looking, you know, really blue now. I don't like that at all. So I need to push it back up to get the blues back where, the, where I want them to be. As an image gets darker, colors become more saturated. As it gets brighter, colors become less saturated. And what you don't want to be doing is to, making, is to be making judgment calls about color um, at the moment in which you should be focusing instead on luminosity. Think of them as two separate things. Okay, tip number three is to create a baseline snapshot as part of your processing workflow. Now, as I've been talking about so far in this video, I like to think of photo processing as a series of steps. It's almost like building the foundation of a house and then building floors above that. You wanna be thinking about uh, progressive enhancement of your photo. Once you have your uh, white balance adjusted, once you've kind of resolved color cast and, you, and you've been able to uh, remove any problems like that, once you've been able to make a decision regarding profile corrections, maybe you've made some exposure edits as well. When you reach that point and you're no longer thinking about your photo from a technical perspective, but you're starting to shift more into creative. What is the mood, the atmosphere, the look, the style? What is it that you wanna do with it from a color perspective? Take that moment and remember to come over here to the left panel and develop, go to snapshots, and just create a baseline snapshot of your photo. Then once you have that in place, you can go wild with your hue, your saturation, your split toning, whatever it is you wanna do from here. It is a far better place to be resetting back to than just going all the way back and losing all your work. 
Tip number four is to use negative clarity and dehaze. Now both clarity and dehaze are contrast sliders. They are in this presence area, which is a really interesting name, by the way. So something that you can actually do is work with the grain of the photo. When the photo wants to lean in a particular direction, help it go even further in that direction. So for me, in this photo, I feel like the photo kind of wants to be a little hazy and a little more atmospheric than how it turned out. So what you can do then is use the dehaze slider and go negative with it. Push it to the left. And I'm just gonna zoom in here so that you're able to see better what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, this is the default. Let me go back up here to the default. This is the default value of zero. And you can see if I increase dehaze, it just adds contrast and it starts bringing out more detail. But that's actually not what I want. So I can move dehaze to the left and you can see that everything is just getting a little bit softer, a little more atmospheric. And you can really kind of see it in here. And uh, it's lifting those shadows, it's softening those midtones, and it, it resembles more of like what I remember the scene looking like when I was there. And clarity is just the same. You can go negative with it as well, which is a nice way to help soften some of those edges in your photo so that you're not, uh, so that everything isn't quite so structured and, and sharp, which I know may sound counterintuitive to people who just obsess over sharpness and always want sharpness, but add a little negative clarity and it'll help give your images, I think, a very filmic kind of look to it. Okay, let's continue on with tip number five, and that is to use a technique I refer to as a reverse vignette. Now, you may find yourself in situations where you may have a photo similar to this one, where you have, you know, these you know, dark areas along the edge of the photograph, you know, down here in the corners as well. I mean, these, you know, this is almost black down here. Um, you know, where it's already fairly dark in the corners and around the sides. Now, in a photo like this where you have a subject that's in the center and you wanna add some mood and some contrast to it, you might be tempted to add vignette. The problem with adding vignette though to a photo like this is because you already have darkness in the corners. You already have you know, shadows that are very, very close to black. And if I were to add a vignette, then those shadows would be pushed over into black. Those pixels would turn pure black. And whenever that happens, you basically have a dead pixel. The data is lost, there's no detail there, it's just flat black. So as a, as a general rule of thumb, you always want to avoid pure black and pure white. Just stay away from it. So the issue here though, is that I want a vignette kind of effect to this image, but I can't apply a regular vignette because it's going to uh, harm the exposure and the detail in those shadows. So what I can do instead is to do a more of like a reverse vignette where I am creating light in the middle of the photo, but leaving the edges alone. So it's very similar, but, but a different technique. So let me just show you really quick how to do that. So you come up here to the radial uh, filter, and let me just draw it over the center of the image here, just over these three rocks, which I talked about. I made a video about these uh, a while back uh, from Death Valley. Um, so, you know, it's using this default uh, value of increasing the exposure outside of the circle. So I'm just going to reset this, come down here and then turn on invert so that the settings I'm going to apply will be applied inside the radial circle as opposed to outside of it. Um, and then I'm going to do, let me just first show you how I, you know, used to always do this in the past. And let me, let me just back out a little bit so it's easier to see. Okay, so typically the way that I would do this in the past was I would, you know, create the radial and then I would push exposure up and then I would pull the highlight slider down. It's creating more contrast in the middle of the image than I wanted. I wanted it to almost have like a spotlight effect, something softer, something that would lift the blacks and not create this, this sharpness, this heavy contrast in the middle, which is what's happening with exposure here. And let me just take, um, actually, I just accidentally pushed that up. So let me just create a snapshot here uh, so you can see the difference. So let me do that. And uh, then I'm going to reset this. Now, 
instead of using exposure and highlights and shadows and those tools, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, what we talked about in the last step. I'm going to add some negative dehaze. Now watch what happens when I do that. Now I drop dehaze down. Now again, this is the kind of thing you don't want to go too far because it gets cloudy and blurry and all kinds of weird stuff. But check out what happens if I just lower this down to like about right about there. I mean, again, like about negative 20, somewhere in there. That, that may be a little too much, honestly. But what it's doing is, is that it's lifting the midtones. It's lifting the light in that area and doing it in a very soft way as opposed to just making it chunkier and, uh, and more contrasty. So let me uh, show you the difference. So that's with uh, dehaze and that's with exposure and the highlights adjustment. Now it's very subtle, but you know, again, I don't think, I mean, I guess it depends on what it is you're trying to do uh, with your photography, but with me, I don't like things to be too heavy handed and this feels heavy handed to me. If I use dehaze instead, you see what I mean? Like it just adds a little bit of punch into the middle of the photo, just a little bit of light, just a, a soft kind of effect that looks totally natural and actually looks more natural than uh, using exposure and highlights. Okay, tip number six is to use the before and after key on your keyboard. This is just a really simple tip, but I love using it. On your keyboard, directly above return or enter, you will find a backslash key. Just press and hold the key and you can see of where your image was when you first started and then let go of the key and you are back to the processed version. Now, what makes this rather uh, rather cool is the fact that if I were to hit reset and go all the way back to the original raw photo, it's actually different. It's uh, it, it doesn't have the same crop that I applied to it before. A crop has been applied to it as part of my process, in other words. So the nice thing about before and after is that it retains that crop. So I'm able to view my changes in context. Okay, tip number seven is to use raw defaults. This has been in Lightroom for a while, but kind of tucked away inside of the import photo and video dialog. If you go to your app preferences and look up here at the top under presets, you'll see this big box that says raw defaults. Now what this controls is what develop panel settings are automatically applied to your imported raw images when they're coming into Lightroom. If you watch one of my other videos about sharpening, you will know that I have never been a fan of the fact that Lightroom applies sharpening as part of the import process. I would just prefer it just to, just to not touch it at all, which gives us a really good opportunity to uh, demonstrate this feature. So I'm gonna come over here. This is a raw straight out of camera file using Adobe defaults. I'm going to drop the sharpening amount down to zero, which gets rid of it entirely. I'm gonna come over here to presets, create a preset. Uh, I'm gonna call this clean import. Then I'm going to go back to my uh, presets in the preferences panel. And instead of using Adobe default as the master, I'm going to select clean import. Now, every single raw photo that I import will have zero sharpening applied to it, which is pretty cool. One other thing I will point out here, but you can also assign specific presets to specific cameras that you use. So check this box, come down here to camera and you will see any cameras that you use and then you'll be able to choose uh, specific presets for those uh, specific cameras if that's something you're interested in doing. Tip number eight is to create a smart collection for your HDR images so they're easier to find. Now, if you do uh, landscape photography work, I would assume that many of you probably uh, bracket your exposure to get the, you know, the greatest amount of dynamic range out of a scene. Now, the trick is, is that if you are editing lots of these, if you're just blending a bunch of HDRs, it can be kind of hard after a while to find those images because of the fact that sometimes they get, you know, put inside of stacks with the individual uh, you know, exposure frames that you created. What you wanna do is go to the left column in the library, click on uh, this little plus sign next to collections and select create smart collection. Now I'm going to, and actually uh, I've already done this once before, so let me just get rid of this so I can explain it. Um, okay, so I'm going to name this uh, Lofoten HDR. Now, uh, because I uh, assign metadata to all my photos, I'm going to select uh, keywords. 
And all of the photos that I took in Lofoten, I tagged as Lofoten. So I'm going to enter that in here. Click the plus sign over here. And then I'm going to select file name type and then choose file name. Leave this as contains. So it's searching for a particular string of text. And then I'm going to enter the acronym HDR. And when I hit return and then look at the grid view, you can see I have three HDR images in here because those are the ones that I've created from this collection of Lofoten uh, images. Okay, tip number nine is to make smaller adjustments in the tone curve panel. Let me show you what I mean. When you hover over one of these nodes in the tone curve, hold down the Option key on a Mac or, or uh, Alt on Windows, and then move the node as you normally would. And when you do that, you'll notice that it's almost like it has like a weird kind of gravitational force unto itself. It just moves slower. It puts up more resistance because without it, you know, it's kind of like this. It moves very, very quickly. So by using option, it slows way down and then you're able to make uh, far more exact uh, adjustments with your curves. All right, congratulations. You made it all the way to tip number 10. For this tip, I'm going to show you how to apply sharpening the correct way in Lightroom. This is a topic I've talked about once before. I actually made a whole video about sharpening and why I prefer to sharpen my photos using Photoshop. But there is something really convenient about doing it in Lightroom as well. And I can respect the fact that um, sometimes sharpening here is just really convenient. By default, the thing that Lightroom does is that it, you know, it gives it a sharpening value of 40. And then down here at the bottom, there is this slider called masking. Now this is a really important slider because if you hold down the um, option key or alt on windows and just click and hold on masking, you'll see that the entire image turns white. Why is it turning white? Well, because this is a mask and like any other mask, white uh, reveals and black conceals. It reveals or conceals the pixels that are underneath the mask. So by clicking and holding on masking when it's down at its default value of zero, you can see that sharpening is being applied to every single pixel in the image, which is uh, not what we want. And it's actually not how sharpening is intended to work. You want to be sharpening edges. You don't want to be sharpening uh, just broad kind of areas of a contiguous color, something like a, a, a blue sky. You don't need to be, you know, sharpening a blue sky. Unfortunately, Lightroom just blankets sharpening across everything. So what you want to do is, you know, kind of get sharpening where you want it by paying particular attention to, you know, one area, you know, like maybe these, uh, you know, uh, fishing villages down here and, you know, kind of get it where you want and then hold down the option key or alt click on masking and then move it to the right. And as you do this, you'll notice that areas of the image are starting to turn black. Those black areas are where sharpening is no longer being applied, which is those flat areas. It's where you just really don't want it to be. Where you want the sharpening to be is to be around your subject, around these um, houses on the side of the fjord here, and then up into the, uh, the peak that's back here as well. You want, you want that to be standing out against the sky. You don't, you don't want it to be, you know, something like this. You want it much higher than that. So just remember when you're applying sharpening as a finishing step, come down to masking and then just, then just dial this in exactly where you want it to be. All right, so that's it. I hope you learned something from this video today. I hope you picked up at least one or two new tips for your workflow. If you have any questions about something that I covered, or if you have a tip of your own that you would like to throw in uh, to the comment section below, by all means, please feel free to do so. I would also be happy to answer any questions uh, if you have a question that you would like to ask. So that's it for me. If you want to see more content like this in the future, I would encourage you to hit subscribe below if you haven't already done so. It really does make a difference in the growth of the channel, so I would appreciate it. And uh, yeah, and that's it for me this week. I'll see you next time.